0110164, and we are ready for the state to call its next witness. Your Honor, at this time, the state would call DCI agent Don Schnicker to the stand. Step forward, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is true and correct, so help you God? I do. Have a seat in the witness chair. Go ahead, Mr. Knapp. Could you please state your name for the record, sir? Yes, Don Schnicker. It's S-C-H-N-I-T-K-E-R. And how are you currently employed? I'm a special agent with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, currently assigned to the Major Crime Unit. As special agent, what does that entail? A DCI special agent is, in essence, a state law enforcement officer that assists local law enforcement with their investigations. There's approximately 26 DCI agents in the Major Crime Unit across the state. Our job is to assist Sheriff's Office, Police Departments, County Attorneys with criminal investigations that we may be able to provide more resources or expertise to. How long have you worked with DCI? I'm on my 19th year. And in becoming an agent with DCI, the Department of Criminal Investigations, what schooling did you undergo? Sure, I have a degree in psychology and sociology from Iowa State University. After graduating college, I attended the Department of Public Safety or the State Police Academy. It's approximately five months long. That gives us a certification as a police officer for the state of Iowa. Once we graduate the police academy, we undergo a field training program where we shadow or work with other DCI agents that have done the job longer. And then throughout the last 19 years, we receive continuing education in our specific field. And what kind of cases do you handle as a special agent? So as an agent in the Major Crime Unit, we work primarily cases of death investigations, sexual assaults, thefts sometimes over a million dollars. Those, I guess in the field that people would consider more of a complex case, some investigations that take longer than maybe a shift or a day or a week, they may take months to investigate. And how many death investigations have you taken part in? So over the last 15 years, I've been lead agent on over 100 death investigations, and I've assisted on probably well over 200 death investigations. And in conducting those investigations, what duties would you have as the lead investigator? So as a lead investigator, your job is to work with that police officer in the jurisdiction you're assisting. Usually they assign a primary officer. In this case, it was Investigator Searin. We work directly with that local contact, and then we, as a lead investigator, work together to assign tasks to other agents or other officers and oversee the case and then ultimately put together a case report that we provide to the prosecutor. And I think you mentioned earlier that sometimes you come in to lend expertise. What other divisions exist within the Department of Criminal Investigations? So with the DPS, specifically in the DCI, we have agents that are assigned to sex offenders, narcotics. You have the casinos, gambling, money laundering cases. And then you have major crimes, which I'm part of, which is more like your homicide, robbery homicide unit. Now, were you ever notified on July 20th of a case that was assigned to you in Ottumwa? I was. And that would be of 2018? That's correct. Now, how does DCI typically become involved in a criminal case throughout Iowa? Sure. So what makes us unique is we're at request agency, which means we have to be invited in to work a case. We can't come into Ottumwa and take over an investigation. That's not how we're set up. So we have to be invited in by either the police chief, the sheriff, or the county attorney to assist in an investigation. In this case, we were invited in by the Ottumwa Police Department to help them with the investigation. Now, once you received your assignment on July 20th, 2018, how did you proceed? That was a Friday. I believe it was around 1 in the afternoon when I was notified of the case. I was given the assignment as lead agent for our office, which means I was in charge of our agents. So I might have two or three additional DCI agents in my same position that would work for me in this case. 
Myself and two other agents responded to Otumwa and we met with Investigator Searing and then we were briefed on the investigation that afternoon. Could you walk us through what took place between the 20th and the 23rd in terms of your investigation? Yeah, so on the 20th we learned uh, basically um, the initial investigation done by the police department, uh, the response to the house, um, the location of Chloe, uh, maybe some initial statements provided by um, the defendant. Um, we were also notified on that 20th that the autopsy was scheduled for that Monday, the 23rd. Uh, so we decided to postpone the investigation and any further until the autopsy. And why would you do that? At that point, uh, the Autumnal Police Department had done a, a good job of interviewing all the people that were there on the 19th when she was found, uh, had a pretty good understanding of the initial statements. Um, and at that point, we decided there wasn't any advantage to do conditional interviews until we had that medical information. Now, as a DCI agent conducting death investigations, do you only participate in murders or do you investigate other forms of death? Other forms of death. A death investigation could be a, a natural death that um, the person dies uh, with nobody witnessing it. So we have to do an investigation to figure out how that happened. It could be a suicide, it could be an accident. Any case uh, in which the individual doesn't die, maybe in a hospital setting where people know or they'd had pre existing health conditions that it was expected, um, a DCI agent could investigate that death. And you noted you postponed the investigation until the autopsy. When do you recall that autopsy taking place? That would have been Monday morning. I believe it was July 23rd. Did you attend that autopsy? I did. What do you recall, if anything, when you attended that autopsy? Uh, the autopsy was conducted by Dr. Michelle Cavalier. I would worked uh, some case with her in the past. Um, I was there for the external examination of Chloe's body. Um, and then I stayed through the majority of the autopsy, and I want to say I left early afternoon. Up to that point, had you completed any written reports? No. Once you left the autopsy, what did you proceed to do after that? I traveled back to Otumwa, uh, met with Investigator Sierra, who was also at the autopsy for some time, um, and we, in essence, made a game plan for the rest of the week. We identified individuals that we wanted to re-interview or interview that hadn't been interviewed, um, and then worked on kind of strategic planning how many assisting agents or officers we would need to get those tasks done. And who did you decide to interview in that game plan? Well, we wanted to re-interview Kelsey Thomas. Uh, additionally, we wanted to interview Aaron Thomas. Um, those were primarily the two interviews we wanted to start with uh, that following day. You know, to re-interview, have you ever interviewed Kelsey Thomas yourself? I had not. So when I use the term re-interview, she had given an initial statement to law enforcement. Um, I wanted to sit down and do a formal, more in-depth interview with her. You may have mentioned this. I apologize if I didn't catch it. Who else did you decide to interview? Uh, Aaron Thomas. And when did you set up the interview with Kelsey Thomas? Investigator Searon, I believe, contacted them that Monday evening, um, and the interviews were set up for the following day, Tuesday the 24th, I believe. Do you remember at what time those were set up for? It was after lunch. I want to say we asked them to come in around 1, if I recall, maybe 12.30. You said them. Who were they? Again, Aaron Thomas and Kelsey Thomas. Uh, when they did they arrive around that time? They did. When they arrived, how did you proceed from there? Uh, I inter uh, I guess I introduced myself to uh, Kelsey Thomas and I believe Aaron Thomas. I met them both in the lobby uh, of the police department, and then at that time, uh, it was determined that Investigator Searon and I would interview Kelsey Thomas, and I would have other agents and another investigator interview Aaron Thomas. And how did you essentially set up that interview, just physically in, in the law enforcement center? Sure. So uh, we, it's a standard interview room. Uh, we would invite them back to the uh, inside the police department. Um, there's, a, I guess, an interview room that is video and audio recorded. Uh, inside the room, it's a table. There's usually two, three to four chairs, depending on how many people are going to participate in the interview. Um, I guess that kind of summarizes what the interview room would look like. And as far as uh, explaining how the interview was going to take place, parameters, 
What did you explain to Ms. Kelsey Thomas? So when we take uh, Ms. Thomas back to the interview room, it is inside the police department. So of course the, the doors are locked coming into the police department. Uh, once she's inside the interview room, we explain to her that she's free to go at any time. Uh, she's showing the doors. Um, the doors are not locked from the inside, so you can leave at any time. Uh, we confirm with her that she knows where the exits are at, where the restrooms are at, um, and that she's comfortable talking with us. Do you remember how she arrived on that day? I believe for that interview, she arrived with uh, her husband. Uh, they drove to the police department. Um, I didn't see them arrive, um, but they came to the front desk and then asked for us. Now, why did you choose to proceed in this way with this interview? Um, this was a what we call a non-custodial interview. Um, we didn't have any charges on Aaron or Kelsey Thomas at that time. It was a voluntary interview. Um, so when we do a voluntary interview, in that fashion, we want to do an interview where we can take the individuals to an interview room that can be recorded and audio and video recorded so we can review that later. Uh, but at the same time, we want to, uh, when it's a non-custodial issue, make sure that they understand that uh, they're free to leave at any time. Now, when you ch began interviewing Kelsey Thomas, uh, how did you approach this interview in terms of technique or uh, just your behavior? The goal of uh, the interview, at that point I knew very little of the information of the case other than the brief statements that she provided to law enforcement initially. Uh, the goal of this interview was to let her talk, kind of have her recall the events uh, of the day, um, additionally recall background about Chloe, about herself, uh, so we could get to know maybe the fi family dynamic a little bit more, get to know what was going on that week, that day, um, and just kind of rehear the story uh, in Kelsey's own words. And at least that approach, have you received any training on how to carry out that approach? I have. We, that, that interview technique is, is, I guess you have to classify it as a, it's a cognitive style of interviewing. Uh, what that means is we're really asking the person just to recall events. Uh, as an interviewer, if I don't believe that I have clarification on an event, I'm going to ask for more detail. Uh, during the interview, if we find inconsistencies or there's something that's not clear, we're going to follow up and ask additional questions. Um, if we feel that there's, you know, factual incorrect information coming out from the person we're interviewing, we're going to ask for clarifying statements. Um, we'll ask for them to recall those memories, maybe in different order, um, to see if there's consistency. And so, do you request that somebody go over the story several times? Often, yes. Now, is every interview the same when you use this, in, this technique? Every interview, I would say, is slightly different. Um, there's definitely techniques uh, that law enforcement use during interviews, um, but as I guess all of us are humans, we have conversations. Each person reacts to uh, a conversation in a different way. Um, some people um, are confrontational. Some people are, um, it takes different approaches for them to feel comfortable with talking with you. Uh, the goal of an interview is really to set a stage for that person we're talking to to feel comfortable to talk about um, hard things. Uh, we want to set a stage that it's uh, uh, an environment where they're, I guess, comfortable enough to talk with us about some of those uh, tragic events. And you noted some of the purpose and goal of, of these interviews. <coughs> as far as a final goal, do you aim to get anything specific in your mind when you conduct these interviews? It, we're, the sole goal of an interview is to find the facts and the truth. <coughs> You know, wherever those facts lead, as a DCI agent, we're fact finders. Uh, we ask questions to get information that's going to lead us to the truth. Give or take, how many of these types of interviews have you conducted in your career? I would say that the primary job of DCI agent is we do in investigations, and all investigations involve interviews. Some in investigations may have hundreds of interviews associated with that one case. Uh, so I've done several hundred, if not a thousand, interviews over my career. And do suspects always confess when you interview them? No. If someone doesn't confess, uh, what is the purpose of continuing that interview? So as I kind of explained earlier, um, 
when we're asking questions, we're looking for uh, <coughs> their recollection of events. Uh, what we can then do is see if those uh, events or statements by that individual matches the evidence. Um, a confession uh, often doesn't happen, uh, so what we look for is inconsistent statements, um, misfacts, um, false information, deception, uh, or statements that are otherwise proven wrong or untruthful. <coughs> If you ask someone a question, do you always just take what they say at face value? We wouldn't get very far if we did. So um, we can't just take anybody's statement, any witness or suspect, um, their statements at face value. We're going to follow up and see if there's factual or, or evidence that backs that statement. Now let's talk more about the technique. Um, could you walk us through? at least for the cognitive interview approach, different goals of, of, this, of that method? So in an interview, um, at a start of an interview, often the conversation is relied heavily on the person you're interviewing. So we give them an opportunity to give what we call a free narrative. Um, that's their time to recall the events uh, with little interruption to the best of their ability um, and give us kind of that full statement, get it all out there for the first time. Um, then in a cognitive interview or our interview style, we go back and then ask those um, for clarification or to expand on that statement. Uh, some individuals, when you ask them to give a free narrative, will talk for hours. Um, some will talk for five minutes and it's more of a question and answer um, from then on. Uh, so it really depends on who you're interviewing. Um, after that interview uh, is done and we get a, an initial statement, uh, we may provide uh, stories or, or statements that are similar to their situation as a rationalization for their actions. Um, we're also looking for a response uh, from their statements to see how they react to additional questions or how they react when we ask them to tell us the chain of events in a different order or if we ask them to provide the entire story in reverse order. We're looking to see if, if it's factual or if it's the truth. Those statements should stay the same. Um, if there's great differences in her the in interviewee's statement and we're looking for why are there inconsistencies. Is it just inconsistencies in how they describe an event you're investigating or are there other inconsistencies you look for? You know, it's just not if somebody says ten oh five as a time and then the next statement they might say ten ten, you know, that's not a glaring um, inconsistent statement. It's shifts or dramatic changes in their story um, is what we're looking for. You mentioned rationalization. Can you tell us more about that in regards to these interviews? So oftentimes, um, in an interview, you have to make the individual feel comfortable to talk about what they've done or what they're alleged to have done. Um, with that, um, we want to set a stage where we may uh, provide stories where other individuals um, may have been in similar situations, and that was the feelings that those individuals were having. Uh, what it does is it gives that individual um, an understanding that they're not the only person this has happened to, and it may provide them an outlet where they feel more comfort, comfortable uh, discussing those events. I want to play a couple of videos for you, Your Honor, as far as States exhibits, I believe there's a prior stipulation as to states exhibits. We've named them 93, 1 through 28, since these are clips. Um, Mr. Knapp, are you going to play those clips consecutively without interruption? And the reason I ask is I need to know how the court reporter is to uh, report any part of this. There will be some interruptions if it pleases the court. I can note when we're about to play one. Once I wish to resume questioning, I'll notify your honor so you can direct the court reporter, and then we'll go back and do that. Over. Um, and that will be fine. Please just say, I'd like to go back on the record, or off the record, we're going to play a clip. And then she will know what's to be reported. Yes, sure. Um, first, let me ask you, 93, 1 through 28? No objection, your honor. States exhibits 93, 1 through 28, RAC. 
can go off the record. Or at this time, the state will play State's Exhibit 93-1. We can go off the record. Myself, Investigator Searin, and the defendant. As far as that door that we saw in the video, was there an officer standing outside that door? No. To your knowledge, was there any officers that you had assigned to stand by any exit of the law enforcement center aside from that door? No. As far as what we saw there, since granted there is background noise, uh, what was going on during that part of the interview? At that interview, it, it was difficult to hear. Um, we were asking her to explain how she found Chloe hanging in the closet and how she was removed. We can go off the record, Your Honor. Oh, sorry. We'll play State's Exhibit 93, sub 2, and we'll go off the record, Your Honor. Off the record. No, when I and I I barely like when I touched her chest, I had my hand just right here to see if I could feel her beat. It just came out. And it didn't there was no force, there was no like, you know, gagging, taking it out. Again, the audio is somewhat muffled. Uh, about how far from the first clip was this, give or take, in terms of subject matter? This would be relatively close proximity in time to that uh, prior clip. Um, this is after Chloe would have been removed um, from the closet and then how she was appearing after. Our state will put next play State's Exhibit 93, sub 3 through 6. We can go off the record. The other one thing I was kind of really, me and my husband were both really angry about is um, KCCI had instantly put them on the face when they put them without even knowing anything. So, of course, you know, um, not so much my husband's going to have that face with but um, I got messages and messages and messages from, you know, everybody on Facebook messaging me.
I think, uh, if I recall correctly, she just brought that up, that that was a point of frustration for her, um, that the news was already reporting her daughter's death. And what was the purpose for the second clip that we just saw asking about Phoenix? Uh, what were you looking for there? I believe, if it, again, if I uh, recall the clip correctly, um, that was a point where she had, had stated in, in her uh, interview that Phoenix was present or was there um, when she was uh, discovered Chloe, and we were asking his reaction to that. And then, in the two videos relating to the water and break, uh, as far as what you were doing outside that room, was it essentially the same setup that we discussed at the beginning? Were there any other armed officers walk, you know, at exits? No, there wasn't any other officers out there. Um, that would have been a break for investigators here and, and myself. And then initially, as you can see there, she um, needed a glass of water. Uh, so we stepped out her and got her a bottle of water. Did you lock the door when you left? I don't believe that door can lock from the inside. Did you lock it from the outside? No, I'm sorry. So you should, uh, it's uh, like a, a fire door. You can always exit. Um, so that door would have been um, exitable by the person inside. You know, at this time, State will play State's Exhibit 93, <laughs> sub 7 through 12. I can go off the record. Off the record? <laughs> no, I kind of get on when I was talking with you. Um, you know, you illustrated to us that there was, you know, uh, a knot tied in, in the pants. You know, obviously we went through, I mean, got around and everything. Um, so today you were kind of relieved. Uh, it seemed like you thought that maybe we had taken the pants. And when I spoke to Sergeant Lampert, he was one of the ones that was kind of on the scene initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, um, he kind of got the impression, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't talked to him for a couple of days, but he kind of got the impression that you had said something that happened to the pants. Because um, I don't think we took them down. Um, I wasn't there. I'm pretty sure we didn't take them down. Mm -hmm. I think I may have, I, I, I know I talked to him about the pants, and he asked me about it. I may have told him that I, I, they came off when I removed her, but everything happened so fast, I would not, and it kept, when, I, when I took her off, it, it looked like they were coming off, but I mean they were coming off of her, so I don't, I don't really know if maybe they actually, all in all, but they came off. Yeah, I didn't know. Thank you. 
would be closer to where she was sitting. Just in case any of it was too muffled, what were your questions throughout this portion of the interview? What was the general topics you were bringing up to Kelsey Thomas? So looks, I think in the first clips we saw, um, we were starting to ask her more detail about, um, specifically about her statement of the pajama pants around um, Chloe's neck, um, how those uh, came off of her, how she actually got um, the pajama pants off her neck. Uh, so uh, several of those clips were about clarification on, on that aspect of her story. And as far as bringing up Aaron, why did you do that? At the same time Aaron was being interviewed by other agents, uh, we wanted to account for his whereabouts. He was another individual that lived at the house, so we wanted to see if there was any chance Aaron was home at this time, which she was confident he was not. And just going to interviewing techniques, what's the purpose of interviewing Aaron in a separate, uh, separately during the same period of time? Anytime we have witnesses, really no matter what the case, we get a better interview if we interview individuals by themselves. Um, if we have two people see the same thing, um, oftentimes if we try to interview them at the same time, uh, one person may do all the talking and the other just kind of goes along. Uh, we want those individuals, that specific person's recollection of events, uh, not a, a community or a group um, remembrance of those facts. 
And you made reference in one of your questions as to Dr. Say relating to the hanging. What information were you relying on at least in posing those questions? From the autopsy that I attended on that Monday, um, it was uh, clear to the doctor, at least uh, as she told us, that she did not feel that Chloe was found in the way uh, which with Kelsey stated, uh, hanging suspended from uh, a noose in a closet. Uh, so our, our, I guess in that stage of the interview, we were telling her that her story doesn't really fit with the evidence that we're seeing. And at this time, the state will play State's Exhibit 93, 13 through 18, off the record. Off the record. Okay. 
That is the truth. All right, no, she was not asleep when I left the house this morning. She was awake. All right, I just, I didn't want to take her with me. She had been acting out. She's been doing this for quite some time now. I don't know why. I don't know why she's been acting out. Okay, there was never any, any physical abuse or any reason to, sleeping and she took Phoenix to uh, the store and left her there um, uh, and then I as you see kind of the we get our first story shift where um, the story changes now Chloe is awake uh, when she leaves and there's some frustration there with uh, her behavior Mr. Steve we'll now play states exhibit 93 19 through 24 
that like she didn't puke. When I laid her on her bed, I, you know, I had my hand on her chest, and that's when it, you know, it came out of her mouth. Yeah. What I'm saying is, I, even though it's your statement, I don't think that you just kind of crushing food out of her, um, you know, her stomach. Okay. Um, you know, the, you know, when you told them, you know, essentially what you observed, um, and I said, um, you know, jump in at any time, but I don't think people usually, um, there's not a bodily reaction to hanging yourself um, consistent with, you know, you don't usually see vomiting after someone hangs himself or during. Um, like I said, maybe I'm wrong. Right now, I think that's exactly what it is. So that's fine. I mean, I, I don't know. They still got to figure out how many clothes are out there. Because see, when, when I noticed that, I lifted her up. Because I thought she was choking. I thought maybe she was throwing up. I lifted her up. I opened her mouth. And I put my finger in there to try to see if I could scoop something out. I, I didn't know. I know. I didn't know if she was choking. I honestly didn't know. That, that's kind of my question is, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, but at this point I'm theorizing, um, is there any chance that you came into the room and, and Chloe had gotten some food? No. Maybe she was eating? Because no. I said, we're, we're trying to put together where this, where this food is coming from. No. Because uh, there's no, no reason that she should have vomited when she hung herself. I just don't know. Uh, like I said, is there a possibility you came into the room when she was eating something? And, you know, obviously. No. The last thing that she had had that I fed her was the ravioli. So uh, Kelsey uh, Thomas went to the restroom. Uh, so when she would have went out that room, she would have went to the right, um, and right outside, the, I believe the next door is the common area restroom. Um, I believe, if I recall correctly, I believe I used the restroom as well, which would have been a different direction. Um, and then at some point, you could hear Investigator Siren indicate 
you know, you can get out, um, but you just have to knock to get back in. So um, we would have been in that hallway and she would have knocked on the door when she was ready to come back to the interview. Was there an officer that went into the restroom with her? No. Now going to the earlier clips, <clears throat> in terms of questioning Kelsey Thomas, uh, why were you bringing up vomit, <clears throat> ravioli, things like that, or as far as confrontation or anything like that? Well, what we had to do is we have to compare her story to what we see at the scene. Um, so she's indicating that there's vomit in the mouth. Um, we know that she also stating that she found Chloe hanging in the closet, um, but we didn't see any vomit in the closet. Um, we saw some uh, vomit or uh, what we believe is food stains on the bed. Uh, so for us, we were trying to uh, understand from her words of, I guess, how that happened. And then we would ask questions of, uh, trying to gather more detail to see if there's any explanation of why there's an absence of vomit in the closet and why there's, you know, vomit or food stains on the bed. Why was it also important to you to question more about the interactions between Kelsey Thomas and Chloe uh, when Kelsey got back home? Um, earlier we kind of had that story shift about, you know, Chloe was awake or Chloe was asleep when they left um, uh, to go to their store. When she returned, um, you know, Originally, she stated everything was fine and they just wanted to take a nap. And then as we kind of progressed and again asked her to retell the story, um, again, uh, there was areas where she said she was frustrated or Chloe was being defiant. Uh, so we wanted to explore that a little further. Our state received to play State's Exhibit 93, 25 through 28 at this time. Can go off the record. Off the record? Dad, or my stepdad, I talked about you know, having kids and I see them, you know, legally on you, Chloe and stuff like that. It scared me. You know, I really did. I, I thought, you know, my mom and my stepdad were trying to take my kids. You know, so me and me, Chloe and her dad, you know, we don't care. Um, even with his mom, I knew that he was my dad. And, you know, I thought, you know, just be any more baby. Just like, you know, trying to take the school. And then, like, that happened to work and everything, too. So, yeah, she was, you know, she the she got, the more she got. She really did. Did you ever touch your mom? Say, you know, you still want to job? You know, you want to take so long? I'd have to be later, yes. Did she ever figure that out? Or was that just not Not really. I mean, she, you know, she would take her for a week in here, a week in there, and everything else would come. Was roughly five and a half hours, um, and then there were some breaks in there. And about at what time of day did your interview end? Greg, I believe it started around 12:30, so I believe it um, stopped somewhere around 5:30 or 6 p.m. And going towards the end, were there any arrangements made for a follow-up interview? Uh, I believe so. Yes. 
Could you walk us through that? Uh, I think we, if I recall correctly, um, we chatted with her and said, you know, there's probably going to be more questions that we have at a later date. Um, would you be willing to come in um, and, and talk to us again? Which she agreed. Um, I believe that the actual second interview was set up at, uh, later that evening or the next morning by a phone, uh, phone call. I also want to play a longer clip of uh, some of those final portions. Your Honor, the state seeks to play State's Exhibit 94. And actually, since I don't know if we brought that up in the prior stipulation, this is also through stipulation uh, as to foundation and authenticity. The state will seek to admit it through that. Any objection to State's Exhibit 94? Number two. Yes, 94. No objection, Your Honor. State's Exhibit 94 is received. All right, this time we would like to play it, go off the record. It's approximately six and a half minutes, seven minutes long. Off the record.
Those are two guys that aren't against each other. Truly. Did you reach out to your mom and say, you still want to I asked her to make her yes. Did she ever agree to that, or was that just not something? <sighs> not really. I mean, she, you know, she would take her for a weekend here, a weekend there, and everything else, but no. She never actually agreed to help me, you know, take her so that I could, you know, you know, try to get calmed down and, you know. And What's the last time you've had a break? trying to figure out, you know, what her level of stress was um, in her household. Now, as far as uh, <clears throat> pretty much the entire period of time for this interview, um, <coughs> at what point did Kelsey Thomas ask to leave the interview? I don't recall if she did. Um, I know that I think at one point maybe she said she was done. Uh, in one of the interviews, and I recall, you know, pointing at the door and say, "There's a door. You know, if you want to leave, leave." At least for July 24th, did she ever leave? No. Well, did she ever leave prior to the end of the interview? No, she didn't leave unannounced. Uh, she stayed in uh, till the end of the interview. Was she handcuffed at any time during July 24th? No. How did she leave on that day? Um, she walked out of the. Um, police department, and I assume she drove home. One moment, 
Your Honor, the next video is approximately an hour to an hour and a half. Should we proceed? Um, is it possible to play like half an hour of it, then take a break? Yes, Your Honor. Is that acceptable to the state? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, so that would be the plan. We'll watch half an hour, and then we'll take our morning break. And um, what is the exhibit number? This will be States Exhibit 95A. And this will also be, there's been a prior stipulation as to this video. Um, state would seek to admit it through that stipulation. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. 95A is received. Um, and uh, Mr. Neff, if you would simply stop the video at about 20 of 11. And we'll take a break and then we'll watch the rest of it. And I think that will be a good breaking time then for lunch. Perfect. Uh, off the record. Oh, actually, before. Oh, back on the record. Now, we're about to play another video. When was the second interview of Kelsey Thomas? It was uh, two days after the initial interview. So I believe that was July 26th. And. Was there any escort for Ms. Thomas to the Law Enforcement Center for that interview? No. How do you recall Ms. Thomas arriving for that interview? I, I, I believe she drove herself um, to the police department. Um, I, wasn't, I didn't witness her actually arrive. She again just came to the front desk of the police department and asked for us. And where were you when she asked for you? I would have been back inside the police department uh, in one of the offices. Your Honor, now we say we'll play the first portion of the video off the record. Off the record.
these facts. Those are facts we've heard that from you. I I've seen them. them. I've seen all. Just because I didn't wake up super early right. that morning and feed for breakfast, look at everything else. Look at the story that I see. You didn't want her. You didn't want her to come with you. You came home. You're upset. You're frustrated. And you wanted her to die. No, I didn't That's have a story home that the facts show. I think there's more to the story than that. I think there's something that went wrong with that house. <laughs> I think that for a split second, you lost your temper. No, I yeah. can not that you're regretful of that. That makes us human. Don't be that monster. You told us that you had a shit life to this point. You got pregnant. But I'm just still shit because you guys won't leave me alone about this. It's not going to go away, Kelsey. It's not going to get better tomorrow. It's not going to get better next week. Like I was saying, you, you've told us every reason of why this happened and what led up to it. I didn't kill her. Listen, Kelsey. Know that we're not accepting that. Of course not. You guys still wouldn't be harassing me about it. We're not harassing you, Kelsey. Again, you've told us that you're going to be all the of why this can't be all the other multitude of things, of uh, the accidental, the all this, all that crap's gone, it's done. We've been through that. We're here now, we know what happened. No, we know. The science obviously shows it. And we're not lying to you about that. Again, you've told us all the way up from 16 how you got pregnant. Your parents are pain in the ass. He doesn't help you. You have every reason to have you. We're going to show all this evidence and everybody's, again, just like we said yesterday, you have a cocktail for what led up to this. It boiled over and we want to know what happened in those moments before Chloe died. I didn't kill her. I didn't even touch her that day. No! We don't want to believe 
believe this was a straight cold-blooded murder, that it was a scheme that you put in place, but that's what it looks like. I didn't fucking kill her, for Christ's sakes! Tell us if we're starting that time with you so we can have those answers. I didn't do it. There's no everyone else is going to have. Help us tell that story. I understand you have to be hurting on this. I, I get that, Kelsey. I, I have to do you? Oh, that's Honestly? Right that. I don't know. Maybe it is just a relief. Maybe this is the first break you've had now that she's gone. Oh, my Maybe God. You're people. just fucking sick. Kelsey, when people watch the interviews we've had with you, and you can sit here and not... This, this is the first shed of emotion that you've shown is being pissed just because we won't let you get by with saying you didn't kill your daughter. What proof do you have that I killed my daughter? Honestly, you gotta show me anything. Do you want to see dead pictures of your daughter? No, not really, because I'm supposed to be going to see her here soon. Like I said, everybody else is going to want to ask why she's too ill. Do you think people aren't going to come to that visitation knowing that the fact that a five year old accidentally hung her toes was complete bullshit? I didn't kill her. That is complete bullshit. As I've already told you, we'll get calls from people saying, this is not right. She absolutely did this. You're, you're getting calls and contacts from people who's been wanting my child. My mom has wanted Chloe since I had her. So they're making phone calls to get a child that's dead now? That doesn't even make sense. I'm not agreeing to this because I didn't do it. So if you guys are going to continue to sit here and try to get me to say something, I'm telling you the truth. The marks on her neck are not consistent with what the marks. The marks the strangulation marks around her neck and on the back of her neck. I she haven't even marks. seen no. anything of this. We're telling you what it is. I am not making this stuff up, Kelsey. I, I think it's a, you freak out and accident happens. I didn't even Hold on for that. I think you need to figure out what am I supposed to do. Maybe I can make it look like she hung herself. But the science doesn't show that. The science shows that she was dead before she was ever inside those pajama pants. That's what the doctor's going to tell me. And they're going to ask Agent Snicker, who was in the house when she died? An adult had to do this. Well, only Kelsey. And we talked to Kelsey, and she, all I can tell you from her is that she was stressed out with her that day and didn't want her around. She wanted her gone. No, I didn't. That's the story, that, the only truthful story that I have that I can back with facts. Because you talked about that in the morning, that you were upset with her. In fact, all you wanted to do was take a nap, and she was supposed to stay in the room. That's what we know. Those are the facts. I haven't heard anything else that makes me explain why a mother would want to do that. I haven't heard a mother tell me that I made a mistake and this was an accident. Oh, I lost my frustration and I didn't want her to die. I didn't even touch her that day. Other than removing her from that closet, I didn't touch her that day. That's not possible. I didn't do it. It's not possible, Jesse. I want, we wanted to believe you. That's why we're back here today. I don't want it. I don't want to sleep. I wanted to believe you. I know my heart. Dr. Cavalier, the pathologist, the doctor who did the autopsy, says this is how it happened. It's not consistent with what mom says. Not at all. But not consistent means the way that mom found her, the way that she said she died, is not true. I don't know how she died. That is how I that's found her. Everything that this is that she died on her own and then somehow get put in the closet. That's not possible. This I is didn't so touch this her. So Kelsey, nobody else had the opportunity to do this for you. <laughs> Locked it in, and Aaron's gone. We know Aaron was not there. I didn't touch her. I didn't kill her. I did nothing to my daughter. You guys can continue to sit here and shake your head and try to get me to say something, and, and you know, that I didn't do it. Obviously, we're here because we know that's a lie. Well, then you guys are lying to your fucking selves because I didn't touch my daughter. So that all of this is lying to us about, I mean, can we agree that your daughter probably should have only had a mark around her neck, right? I don't even know about any of the marks. I removed her from a closet. But How am I supposed to know about any of the fucking marks? By the way, you described your daughter stuck her head in her hands. That I guess. That's how I found her. I I don't know what she had in the back of her neck. I don't know. I didn't Has touch her that day. On the back of, I don't know. I'm not asking that right now. I'm saying, I'm telling you, as a fact, your daughter had a fingerprint on the, on the back of her neck, which was not consistent with the one on the front of her neck. That's a little bit more evidence that maybe we didn't fully share with you yesterday. You're, you're getting deeper and deeper. You're, you're locked 
locking yourself in to lies that you're not no, able to back out of later. I am not lying about it. Remember when I talked about, you know, six, nine months, whatever it is down the road, when you realize, holy shit, I have myself in a corner. I do look I'm not back in a corner, and I'm not a monster because I didn't kill my dad. And I'm not going to continue to sit here and have you guys tell me that I killed my daughter when I didn't kill her. But where is he wrong? Because I didn't touch her. I didn't do anything. I took a fucking nap because I wanted to sleep so I could go to work. I nap every fucking day before I go to work. I don't think that's all you wanted to do that day. Yeah, I don't believe she really was. I mean, the, 
where, how do the hand sticks and bed and still never answer that? Because we know that it had to be a knot hard enough and tight enough that it's colder, but yet you're telling us it was a knot loose enough that it just fell off when you were moving. Because no officers touched that. No way any cop went in there and removed that. Thank you. 
She didn't come out of her room. There was no tension between me and her. I was not pissed off. Nothing happened. So this case comes out in the back, says, and tell me who's they are. Thank you. 